Hey everybody, welcome to How To Be Mesmerizing. It's Tim Schur and today in our special Mesmerizing CEO Secrets series, we are talking to Danielle McDowell. Danielle, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Tim. Uh, it is a treat. So Danielle is Managing Director of 76 Forward at 16 Tech, which people that are uh, involved with technology and entrepreneurs in Indianapolis, Indiana, where we both are located, uh, know what that is. So um, uh, all the information about Danielle is in there. She's a very powerful force in Indianapolis. Uh, she's been connected with the uh, startup community for many, many years and is also uh, a successful founder of a business. She uh, created a business and sold it. And so let's talk about that first. So, um, uh, so Danielle, not only are you a powerful collaborative force here in Indy with the startup community, you're also an entrepreneurial disruptor in the beauty supply industry. So tell us about your former company and how you created such a ruckus in the beauty industry. <laughs> so ruckus is a great word for that. I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, I think what's interesting about, um, you know, looking at the beauty industry uh, I, my business partner and I really took a look at um, where the opportunities were and, and identified that there was a really great opportunity specifically in the beauty industry to be able to allow for beauty professionals to market themselves more effectively. Mm -hmm. We saw that Angie's List here in Indianapolis was doing a good job with that with people like plumbers and contractors and things like that, but they really weren't addressing this beauty professional market. And so... Um, we really went after it uh, to see whether or not we could build a platform for, you know, these beauty pro professionals to be able to market themselves more effectively. And as we dug deeper into the industry, we learned that there was really two, um, you know, major beauty product distributors um, that were the major players, not just here in the U.S., but, you know, throughout the world. And those two players are L'Oreal and Beauty, um, Sally Beauty. And so in doing that, um, we started identifying, you know, what does it look like to uh, have a product go from being not just created, but also manufactured and then distributed? And then how does it get to your hairstylist? And then how does your hairstylist market it and uh, promote it to their clients that sit inside their chair? So uh, in identifying, you know, what that full product life cycle looked like, and then also, um, you know, trying to understand a little more uh, as to how that impacted, you know, that, that hairstylist who is not just an end consumer, but also essentially an ambassador a lot of times for a brand. Um, we saw a huge opportunity to be able to bring the beauty industry, you know, closer into, you know, this world of internet whether we're in 2.0 or 3.0, wherever we are, uh, saw this opportunity to bring uh, beauty products, uh, you know, in and market them and, and distribute them in a different way. Yeah. So um, after building a platform for hairstylists to market themselves, where they created profiles, um, we essentially bolted on a content engine where we were pushing out up to 20 articles every day, specifically about hair. Um, we had about 35 bloggers all over the United States um, of whom, you know, would write about their experiences with their own hair, um, you know, how they felt about it, how different trends impacted them. They would talk about different ways that they, you know, utilize different products. Um, and then as we were talking more about those products, we identified that, you know, there was really an interesting distribution market for specifically professional grade hair products. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is back in like 2012. And so if you went and looked at the back of a, a shampoo bottle, um, of which was a professional brand, you would notice that there was a little tag on the back that said, this is only, you know, valid if it's purchased through a professional beauty you know, beauty hairstylist. This is from a, a licensed professional. And so what was happening is uh, there was this uh, essentially a, a what's called a diversion market. And so there were folks who were essentially selling these products. They would warehouse them and then sell them to, um, you know, eBay and Amazon as individual sellers, or they'd even sell them to groups like Walgreens or Target or Walmart. And so when you saw those products, they actually did not get there through um, the appropriate uh, distribution, uh, you know, uh, 
mm -hmm. channels. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. and they they got there through diversion. And so um, when we were meeting with a company called L'Oreal, uh, they told us that this was a, a billion dollar problem that they had. And we said, mm -hmm. great. You know, we have a solution. Not only do we have this network of hairstylists all over the country, we had thousands of them at that point. Mm -hmm. um, we also had this platform where we were talking about products to consumers. And so we essentially said, great, we will uh, develop an e-commerce platform that will allow us to um, market the beauty products and then to be able to drop ship them. And then finally, we'd be able to give a commission to that hairstylist so that they can participate in that, uh, you know, share of the profits. And so, which is, you know, how that, how that original distribution model was, was built was ensuring that, you know, hairstylists were representing those products. And so, um, we built a, a platform, an e-commerce platform where hairstylists could not only recommend products to their customers, um, customers were able to go on, find, find their hairstylist and then also, uh, purchase the products directly. And so, as soon as we did that, Sally Beauty came knocking on our door and said, you know, we feel like uh, you guys opened up the the notes that we had for developing what an e-commerce platform looks like, you know, and they asked, you know, are you guys interested in being acquired? And we said, yeah, that sounds great. So in 2013, the business uh, at that time, it was called Jada Beauty, uh, mm -hmm. was acquired by Sally Beauty. And today it lives on as locks of beauty and that IP is still, you know, in that distribution cycle. Wow. That's amazing. You know, the, one of the, uh, the secrets of success is finding that billion dollar problem, right? Yeah. What is the biggest problem that people are struggling with? And then how do we solve that problem? And, and you saw that and, and took advantage of that opportunity and, and, you know, had a, a huge, you know, suppliers say, Hey, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's work together. And that was very smooth and very short. I know that there was a lot of bumps along the way and you had a lot of people trying to take you out and take you down because you were doing something that wasn't traditionally done uh, by both of those companies, Sally and L'Oreal until they yeah. realized at least Sally realized that you weren't going anywhere and you had opened the door, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, found a solution. And so they were smart in acquiring you. <laughs> yes, yes, it was an interesting time. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, you and I had, had talked previously and I shared a story about how, um, you know, we were we were in a position where we had launched this e-commerce platform. And, you know, we our team, you know, really was not we were we were not in the beauty industry. You know, we we went after this idea because, you know, we saw a problem. We we knew that there was a better way to provide that solution there was a better way to get these products into the hands of consumers mm -hmm. and you know there no one was out there solving the problem and so you know what better <laughs> great businesses are always born you know with a problem in mind when you're solving a problem the ability to you know launch and and deliver a product is just significantly you know your your, your rate of success will be significantly higher yeah. So for us, you know, as we sat there, um, you know, in our small office in central Indiana, um, we were, uh, you know, just a small team of, you know, four or five people. And we had, you know, products that we had purchased you know, pretty much at cost, um, at, you know, in our, our back storage area. And we were getting orders in, but, you know, nothing crazy. And, you know, here we got a knock on our door one day and uh, received this, you know, big manila envelope that essentially was a cease and, cease and desist letter from some of these big brands. And so, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, you can tell this story of, you know, what the path to success looked like, but there were definitely some bumps along the road that we had to overcome. And so, um, you know, when we received that cease and desist letter, we knew that, you know, there, one, we knew that we weren't breaking any rules, we weren't breaking any laws. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there really wasn't a lot of, um, you know, there, there wasn't a, a legal leg to stand on for this company. However, you know, if they were to pursue it, it would have stopped us dead in our tracks. There's no way that, you know, a small, uh, you know, very <laughs> a venture backed company would be able to incur the legal bills that, you know, something like a, a large beauty brand would be able to. And, um, you know, one of the 
one of the, the uh, it was a woman who, um, you know, worked for a very large uh, beauty brand of which, you know, people, a lot of people would know it, in, it includes <laughs> the, one of the founders, you know, the mixture of the, two of the founders names. And, you know, this man has gone on to be, you know, a, a multi-billionaire. He's a phenomenal entrepreneur, but he had hired a, a former FBI agent to uh, work on this, this problem of diversion specifically for his company. And uh, this woman called us one day out of the blue on our phone and said, you know, I want you to know that we're watching you. We see what you're doing. We really know that you are not breaking any laws. You're not breaking any rules. Um, you know, we can see that you're acquiring these products through legitimate channels. Um, and, you know, we, we want you to know that, you know, this is a really interesting solution. So, um, you know, if <laughs> there was really no solution except, you know, hey, just keep in mind that we've got our eye on you. And uh, it was a, it was a very interesting time. You know, when you are sitting in a small office, you know, in, uh, you know, in a strip mall in central Indiana, and you're getting a phone call from a former FBI agent telling you that <laughs> you're doing it by a billionaire. Blur yeah, brand. Exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. It was a little, it was a little rattling. It was a little, yeah. but yeah. But you held tight though. And that's, I mean, those are the best kinds yeah. of stories, right? I mean, it yeah. takes an amazing amount of, um, of guts and grit to be able to handle so much uncertainty and so many challenges. Um, but that's what, you know, visionary people do, you know, we keep believing that it's going to work out somehow in some way. And that's what you did, which is pretty amazing. So you've been embedded in the, uh, Indianapolis startup community since around 2006. And uh, so what drew you into wanting to work uh, with and eventually running uh, these entrepreneurial ecosystems? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, what really pushed me into it was, you know, a, a sheer love of, you know, solving big, hairy problems. You know, I love looking at a really complex issue and identifying different ways that teams can come together and collaborate. And um, even if it's, you know, teams from, you know, different companies, I think that, you know, being able to solve some of these, you know, large scale issues and, and drive growth is always something that has just really, um, you know, really been a, a focus for me. So I was an athlete, um, you know, born and raised as an athlete, and I've always been very goal oriented. And I've always had, you know, some sort of, um, you know, there was always some sort of, of end game, you know, when you're on a team, there's, there's a championship or, you know, a PR that you're working for. And that's just how I was, I was raised. And so as I started to transition into the, the business world, um, you know, I, I actually started working for uh, the Pacers here in Indianapolis and mm -hmm. it's a great organization, um, great culture. However, the, the job just really didn't fulfill me. You know, I identified very quickly that the role that I was in, specifically in inside sales, where I just, I didn't feel like I was making an impact. And, um, you know, I wanted to be a part of a team where, you know, my, where I knew that the work that I would do would be di directly impacted by the business. And so that's where I really started plugging into the startup community. Um, I met a man named Scott Jones, who has been a phenomenal mentor for me. Um, and he essentially showed me the path on what it looked like to architect a technology business um, and, and have a, you know, do a venture raise and identify different ways that, um, you know, you can, you can build technology businesses. And so um, while I was there, you know, I really started, uh, we, we really started as a team, we started plugging into the Indianapolis community. And Scott has always really been um, a big proponent of um, identifying different ways to lift up Indiana. Um, and so that, you know, that definitely rubbed off on me. I started seeing, you know, a lot of different, um, you know, technology businesses that were starting to pop up. Um, but as I got a little bit deeper into the industry, I also started identifying different ways that, you know, where, where some of the issues were and a lot of it, um, you know, a lot of it spurred from the fact that, um, you know, there, there weren't 
there weren't a, while we did have convening organizations, you know, there weren't eco true ecosystems that were being built. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, some of the work that, um, you know, these entrepreneurial ecosystems, uh, groups like the speakeasy groups, like launch fishers and launch Indianapolis, uh, you know, groups like tech point here in Indianapolis, these groups have, uh, you know, always been looking out for different ways that Indianapolis can advance, not just the technology industry, but also the entrepreneurial industry. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure how many of your, your listeners, um, you know, know this, but Indiana, Indiana specifically ranks, um, you know, some, some, some studies will show you 47, some studies will show you 48. And the amount of entrepreneur, you know, the amount of entrepreneurial businesses that are started here in the state, 48 out of 50 states. I mean, that is pitiful. And when you start looking at, you know, different ways that we can be impactful, entrepreneurism is by far one of the ways that you can, you know, someone can change the trajectory of their life. You know, that is the best way to create, um, you know, generational wealth, not just for you, but for the, the people and also create freedom for yourself. And so, you know, I truly believe that entrepreneurism is the path that, uh, you know, the single path that can really pull someone, you know, out of poverty and be able to give them opportunities. And so different ways that we can not only teach people about entrepreneurism, but encourage them and give them the support systems to be able to start their businesses is something that I'm very, very passionate about. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Yeah. You know, I, um, my wife and I, both our dads worked in the steel mill and they were both electricians. And, uh, you know, we went to college and I was the first one in my family to go to college. And, uh, and then I was in psychology. And so the career path was you worked in a hospital, you know, until you're maybe 50 and then you open a private practice. Well, I decided to become an entrepreneur at the age of 25. And that's when I opened my practice. <laughs> and so yeah. instead of starting, I'm 51. So instead of starting my practice, now I've been in practice for 26 years. And so, yeah, so being an entrepreneur, uh, has, you know, if, if, uh, you are ready for an experience like that, it, it will take you down a path that, um, can really make dreams come true. It really so, can. Yeah. So from 2015 to 2018, you were the executive director of the speak easy, mm -hmm. which was a member-based nonprofit organization here in Indy that brought established businesses and entrepreneurs together to create healthy entrepreneurial ecosystems that allowed for creativity, collaboration, and education. So what was it like running the Speak Easy? Oh, it was an honor. It was honestly one of you know the favorite times in my life. It, it is such a unique community and a unique network of people. Um, what was interesting is some of the investors uh, that uh, invested in the business Jada Beauty um, had also been the founders of the Speakeasy. Mm. And, um, you know, I knew that there was this desire to create this burgeoning ecosystem of not just tech entrepreneurs, but also, you know, supporting the entrepreneurial ecosystem at large. So whether that looked like su supporting not for profit organizations or, you know, what I would call Main Street businesses or even restaurants and different service style industries. Um, you know, those are the groups that that we were able to support. And, you know, what's interesting about the Speakeasy is, um, you know, we had just a phenomenal group of people that were very, very passionate about what the Speakeasy represented and the freedom and the, um, you know, ability to connect with people um, was was just outstanding. And, you know, we had this really phenomenal core group of members that just cared deeply and passionately about not just the speakeasy, but the ability to create that community. And so that was my first exposure to what it looked like to truly create an ecosystem and what that meant. Um, and so when you start looking at you know, ecosystems, you know, maybe you think of something like a, a rainforest ecosystem, right, mm -hmm. where you've got, you know, whether that um, impacts the ecosystem, you've got plants, animals, soil, you've got, you know, microorganisms, uh, you know, that are all this part of a very, you know, fragile, but, um, you know, beautiful system. And so, you know, you've got different groups that support uh, and give, and then you also have different groups that will, you know, take and give in another way. And so that is exactly what 
um, you know, what I was able to identify at the speakeasy is that, you know, you've got these uh, not just entrepreneurs, but you also have the supporting organizations that it takes to help lift up those entrepreneurs and help them be successful. And then underneath the entrepreneurs, you have a whole team of people of whom, you know, are are part of that business and pushing it forward and, um, you know, working on different skill sets and, and passions on their own. And so um, it was just a, a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. And also one, you know, where I was able to learn about what innovation hubs looked like. And so, um, you know, we had this very unique system that was focused on all different kinds of entrepreneurs. And I started uh, running across, so my, my board came to me and said, Danielle, you know, we'd really like to open up another location and start creating a hub and spoke system here in Indianapolis where, you know, we can connect not only with this community that we had had in Broad Ripple, but also to start to uh, grow a, a larger community downtown Indianapolis, and then also connect with other um, ecosystems across the city and in the suburbs. And so I said, great, this sounds awesome. And, you know, my first my first inclination with a challenge like that, I always, you know, hit the internet and do my research. And so mm -hmm. I ended up running across a body of work, um, specifically out of Stanford, of which started talking about what innovation hubs look like and how to drive mm -hmm. entrepreneurism, you know, really intentionally drive entrepreneurism and really intentionally figure out how to, um, you know, spur specifically innovations and patents and new businesses. And so, um, you know, that's really where I was able to identify, um, you know, what the makings of an innovation hub might look like. And I got really, really excited and really, really passionate about that. And so um, in 2017 is when I was on a, a panel with the current C or the past CEO of 16 Tech. And I was announcing the fact that we were opening up this downtown location. And I was talking about, you know, how to, how to build this ecosystem and how to build this community and, you know, that we had had, you know, we were able to pull in a university and, you know, different public sector supporters and brought, bringing them to the table. And, you know, sure enough, I was sitting next to Betsy McGraw and she had said, yeah, you know, we're getting ready to launch, uh, you know, 16 Tech, which will be Indianapolis's premier innovation hub. And as soon as I heard that, I knew, I knew that day that this was something I wanted to be a part of. So, yeah, uh, ecosystems are are interesting and just as unique as the rainforest yeah, <laughs> when we're yeah. here trying to build a community. That's right. Building communities. So, uh, you know, capitalism can breed fierce competition, yet most entrepreneurs recognize that collaboration leads to faster breakthroughs and more rapid growth. So what are your thoughts on this? And do you have any examples of startups, um, companies who were collaborating together in these tech communities, uh, you know, that you've been running? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll give you a great example of one that's happening, you know, here, uh, here in, in 16 Tech at 76 Forward. Um, we have a group um, of which are, you know, really diving into the analytics sector. And um, you know, specifically, you know, big data is something that, you know, I don't know that anybody's really been able to wrap their arms around it. Nobody has, you know, solved that problem, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and data is something that, uh, you know, I don't, I don't care who you are. I don't, I don't care if you are a small, you know, business that is, you know, selling widgets on the side of the road, or if you are a big, um, you know, organization like, you know, Facebook or Microsoft or IBM. Data is something that touches every single business across the board. And so, um, you know, we have an organization here of which is a project we call Analytics In. Uh, it's mm -hmm. housed here in 76 Forward at 16 Tech. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to be able to put major research universities up alongside uh, large businesses to see whether or not we can intentionally, one, you know, solve big problems that are coming down the pipeline, specifically in data and analytics, and two, can we intentionally create a community and a talent pipeline here, uh, you know, on this campus and here in Indianapolis to serve the businesses that are, you know, growing and, and are rooted here in Indianapolis and in the state of Indiana. And so, um, you know, great example is, you know, we have 
group here, um, IU Health, it's run, uh, they, they have a cybersecurity lab here. It's run by a man named Nick Sturgeon, who is just delightful and awesome and very, very dedicated to his craft. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able to run a program. Uh, we work alongside a group called Bio Crossroads, which is located across the street here at CICP. Mm -hmm. um, if you'll notice, you know, one of the key things is that all of these businesses are, you know, have some sort of, of uh, association physically here with this space. So that's really important. And so what we did was we had a, 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 what we called a kickoff meeting where we brought um, all of the um, leading professors from IU, Purdue and Notre Dame here to Indianapolis, or we had them zoom in. So hybrid is one of our specialties. We're starting to have to have to embrace that, right? That's yeah, correct. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so we brought them here to Indianapolis and then we brought in some of the major, um, you know, leaders from some of the major corporations. And, you know, we started looking at big, hairy, audacious problems and said, let's put it out there. Let's identify what these problems are and yeah. see if we can't really uh, you know, go through a process where we intentionally not just create solutions, but also build a bigger network of people of whom are associated in studying this and you know, solving these problems so that we can then identify different ways that we can not only serve um, you know, the, the businesses here in Indianapolis, but you, know, you have to imagine that there will be some pretty new innovations that come out of that as well. So um, yeah. we've got some, we've got some interesting ideas that I, I mean, I have to say that <laughs> inside this session, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there were probably 20, 20 or so new businesses that could have been created just from this, you know, three and four hour meeting that we had here on site. So it was really a, a unique uh, experience to be able to witness. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful example. Collaboration is essential. Even if it's just within your own organization, you know, I would have people take a look at some of the problems that they were having and and then we would pull people from all different departments, you know, instead of saying, well, this is just a merchandising issue, you know, or this is just a shipping issue or just a sales issue. We were pulling people in from every department. And when you do that, you get ideas. And just like, uh, you know, with your communities here, you pull in people from different industries. And you think, well, they're not even a part of our industry. Yeah, but they're looking at it from a completely different angle. And that's what gives you more pieces of the puzzle that it gives you those aha moments and those exciting breakthroughs. So very cool. So now you're currently managing, uh, you're the managing director of 76 Forward mm -hmm. and they exist to create a world where anyone with the entrepreneurial drive can gain equal access to the resources needed to foster innovation and solve real world problems, which I love. So yeah. tell me a little bit about 76 Forward and what the plan is for perhaps the next five years. Yeah. Um, so 76 Forward is an amazing organization. Um, it was founded in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, it's really, it, it's gone through a couple iterations. Um, you know, we focus in not just on spaces and space operations, but giving people access to the opportunities to become an entrepreneur. And so really what that looks like is, uh, we not only provide physical space for somebody to come and, you know, the ecosystem for somebody to plug into, mm -hmm. but then we've also been really, um, you know, really focused on creating and curating curriculum of which will educate and be able to ramp somebody into a, a, a scenario where they're able to, uh, you know, essentially re it's removing barriers to entry. So it's being able to educate someone on how to ramp themselves into starting that business faster than if they were to go it alone. So um, we put on a series of programming. We do uh, generally about two to three accelerators every single year. Um, and then we also have a, a national network of entrepreneurs uh, of which we you know, both tap into for advice as well as support in creating their businesses. So um, you know, we have about 60,000 people all over the United States have, who have kind of, you know, raised their hand and said, you know, I'm very interested in, in being a part of this network. Um, so it's not just, 
people from our physical locations, um, but it's also, you know, people inside of this network of whom are, are very interested in supporting entrepreneurism across the United States as well. And so, you know, the other thing that I think is really unique about 76 Forward, it is a uh, women-owned business and, you know, the executive team is all women, which is really an interesting and unique, um, you know, <laughs> prospect, right? Yeah. And so uh, it's something that, you know, specifically um, entrepreneurism and women in business has been something that's been a passion of mine um, that, you know, I, I, would, I speak about. And one of the things that, you know, I love to say is that diverse inputs will create diverse outputs. So when you bring a group of diverse people to the table to solve one of those big hairy problems, mm -hmm. the likelihood of you coming up with something that's truly innovative and something that's truly disruptive increases dramatically when you have different people from different backgrounds at the table. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that one of the things that 76 Forward focuses in on is making sure that we're not only supporting you know, people who are, whether it be women owned businesses or minority owned businesses, that we are not just giving them a seat at the table, but promoting and focusing in on their stories so that we're able to create and cultivate that access to opportunity. So it's it's a really great organization. Um, not only do they, they have big goals, but they also have some really great operational chops. So we've been able to open a 56,000 square foot location here in Indianapolis. Wow. We opened in April and uh, January 1st, we'll be at about 70% uh, occupancy. So it's been, wow. it's been a wild ride. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's very exciting. So how can people learn more about you, Danielle, and 76 forward at 16 Tech? Yeah. So here in Indianapolis, the best place to visit is the 16 Tech um, it's 16tech.com. You can go there and learn about the building that 76 Forward is located in. So we not only have this co-working and fractional office space, we also have a phenomenal food hall of which uh, the majority of um, entrepreneurs inside of that are uh, new entrepreneurs and minority and, and women-owned businesses. But we also have a maker space inside of our building as well. So uh, 16tech.com, it also talks about the district and the big plans that we have. This will be a 10-year project uh, that we're embarking on, so it's really exciting. And you can hit the 76 Forward website directly from the 16 Tech website, and you're able to see what 76 Forward looks like, specifically nationwide. Um, and you can book a tour. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just a link away. So you can book a tour with me right on that website. And uh, I would love to host you here at uh, our location. Outstanding. Danielle, thank you so much for being a mesmerizing guest today. This was absolutely wonderful. And I look forward to seeing you again real soon. Same, same. Thanks, Tim. I look forward to seeing you here at 16 Tech. Yay. <laughs> awesome. We'll talk soon. All right.